This is been my happy, happy birthday, birthday to you, Jack. Jack. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Yay! Yay. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. It's like the early days of VMR and getting Zoom bombed, but exponentially better. Um, Maddie knows that this is at least singing number two, Jack. How many? How many have there been so far? Uh, those two. My uh, yeah, those two. Those are the the two full have the two full happy birthdays. Both of which have successfully made me blush. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> well, um, the truth is, folks. Um, when I inhale this uh, meal after um, rounding with the team, it's a delight. It really is a delight to be here. We're here. It happens to be Halloween. We're here to celebrate Jack. And um, I, um, I don't think we can think of any better way than to hang out and um, discuss a case. I have a special one near and dear to my heart, saved exclusively for the one and only Dr. Penner. Um, and um, I'm a little sad because um, Reza can't make it today. He had the unique and extraordinary opportunity to do a grand rounds at his home institution, UCLA at the same time as what we're doing this now. So um, for that reason alone, he can't make it to join us today, but I know he sends his love um, to the one and only Dr. Penner and misses um, hanging out with you all. Um, so we miss him, but are very, very excited to, um, to share Jack's special day. So Dr. Penner, I have a really cool case prepared for you, um, but I think that before we, um, um, before we dive into the case details and and whatnot, I wanted to give you a little bit of a um, a little a little bit of a flavor of what we're hoping to do. So I'll present the case in the usual format, and um, there may be one or two surprises along the way from people uh, who I know and love very well, but not me. But I would love for you um, before you sort of like share your thoughts on the case to just tell us. Um, along the way about your journey in medicine. So I will just kind of like ask you a few questions along the way and um, and to highlight you um, and then pass the mic to you to analyze the case. Does that sound okay? That sounds great. That sounds perfect. That sounds okay. perfect. Let's do it. Um, all right, y'all want to get the whiteboard up? So Dr. Penner, before I tell you anything about the case, um, oh, I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious, how, um, how does your family celebrate your birthday? What do you all usually do? You know, for a long time growing up, um, Halloween was still like Halloween in my house. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, think, uh, I think you know the story that I'm going to tell here, which is that um, for the longest time, like again, like, like Halloween was my birthday, but it was also like I grew up, I was really lucky to grow up in a neighborhood where there was like a really wonderful community and like we had you know, big streets and lots of, lot, lot, lots of kids my age. And so like our neighborhood was like a, um, a scene growing up for Halloween. And so, you know, we would have trick or treaters come over and my brother and sister, like when I was really young, my brother is eight years older than me. My sister is six years older than me. So we used to, um, so like their friends would come by and there would be trick or treating. And for a long time, I didn't understand that Halloween was actually a holiday. Uh, I was just under the impression that Halloween was my birthday. And so I used to, I got to, when I was like old enough to kind of like be up a little bit later and stuff, I got to sit on our porch with my sister and my parents and like hand out candy and people would come and trick or treat. And this is a story as I've been told it. I don't remember it. But it's a story that I've, as I've been told that I would sit there and hand out candy and say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> as I would give pieces of candy to people. And one day my sister is like, she's like, Jack, why are you saying thank you to people? And I was like, well, they're coming dressed up for my birthday. That's so nice of them. And she was like, oh, but like, I, like, I don't know if I want to pop this bubble for you today, but like no one is here for your birthday. They are here because it's a day where they get free candy from houses. Um, and that was when I learned what Halloween actually was. So for the longest time, I was like, oh, I'm just the lucky one who has costumes and candy on, on his birthday. Um, uh, and that tradition has continued uh, in that uh, there is still Halloween and trick-or-treating in my neighborhood, but I now am all the wiser to know what they're, what they're really coming by for. 
Uh, that's absolutely incredible. I think I, I have heard that story before. It's one of, one of my favorite Jack Benner stories. And I think the chat is telling you to feel the same way. Well, my little gift to you for which you'll, um, um, you know, the, the case outcome is unfor unfortunate. I'll say that from the get-go, but you'll thank me for the incredible like educational exercise that this was. And I'll tell you this, the scene. The scene was I was on um, with the busiest um, admitting hospital at UCSF Medical Center as a resident. And this is when in the, in the beginning of my second year. And, um, and I get a page from the ER. That's how you know you're getting an admission is you get a page and it shows up as a text. And it says admission, 42 year old woman with multi-organ issues, including um, um, high calcium, anemia and kidney injury. Major concern is for severe sinus tachycardia and hypotension. And the truth is you see this right away and you're so, so worried. I would love to tap into what would cross your mind um, to bridge the gap between you and then getting a little bit more information from the ER doctor, which will happen in the next two minutes. So what crosses, take us on the journey where your head, mind is at with just this information. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say, you know, I think um, the, there are, um, uh, I wish that this weren't the case, but unfortunately there are so many different paths by which somebody can develop multi-organ issues um, uh, in the lens at least that I practice, which is in internal medicine. You know, I think the, um, uh, so what feels a little bit overwhelming and also scary about this case is that there are so many different disease processes, all of which will require potentially different treatments depending on the mechanism or the category of disease that we're dealing with that can all coalesce onto this really sort of devastating and, um, uh, um, uh, you know, what sounds like a, what has a high potential to be a really tragic outcome. I think the question for me then becomes actually winding back and saying, okay, how can I back cast from multi-organ issues to the thing that led to multi-organ issues? And I would say sort of a simple framework that I, or um, a simple framework that I sort of fall back on when, when thinking about the paths that can lead to there is a few of them. I think one of them most commonly, at least that I, that I feel like I, I um, uh, have the opportunity um, to get to think through is sort of overwhelming di disseminated infection and the way that that can sort of very rapidly progress to multi-organ failure, right? I would say that that is probably the, the, the most common. Um, another one that always crosses my mind, you know, is, is there some ingestion or some exposure that has led to um, uh, 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 multi-organ dysfunction and hypotension, whether that is a medication injection, a toxin ingestion, or the exposure to a, a toxin, not necessarily from an, an ingestion, but actually, for example, a case that we were lucky enough to have on here from Nikita, a case of you know somebody who maybe has been exposed to something environmentally that ends up leading to multi-organ failure, right? And those are sort of probably like the two most glaring ones because those are ones that require us to reverse them very, very, very quickly, right? The rapidity at which someone develops multi-organ failure from infection usually also re relates to the rapidity by, by which we have to solve that problem. And the same thing goes from an ingestion. After those two, then, the, then I think the other ones that I think about that can certainly have a path toward, toward multi-organ dysfunction would be underlying malignancy and underlying autoimmune disease. And the category by which those two do it, I think is sort, is sort of through the shared path of um, something like, for example, HLH, which again is something that I have seen much more common than I wish I have. So I think that sort of is where my brain goes first. It's like overwhelming infection, some sort of toxin or, or substance that this person has been exposed to, and then keeping in the back of my head the potential for um, uh, a severe um, sort of inflammatory response to another acquired disease like cancer or autoimmune disease. And then where my brain goes is to sort of filter through the other findings that we have here and say, which of these ends up being the most specific, right? Anemia, incredibly common in infection, um, autoimmune disease and underlying cancer, but maybe not super common in the setting of something like a toxin exposure, because anemia usually takes time to develop, right? The acute kidney injury, we can certainly see in any multi-organ dysfunction, because that is an organ that is dysfunctioning. The hemodynamic instability, again, is going to be shared by these different underlying things. And so I think for me, the high calcium ends up offering potentially the most useful diagnostic filter by which to move through this. Um, and I think what the high calcium does is it not, it doesn't help me rule out any of those categories, but it does help me prioritize a little bit. For example, hypercalcemia from infection, the way that I can start to link that is not necessarily through an infection itself, but an underlying immunocompromised state like cancer um, or a disseminated granulomatous disease, right? And so I think the calcium here makes me start to frame and say, okay, infection still certainly is, is on the hook. 
autoimmune disease, cancer, and a possible ingestion is on the hook, but it helps me to maybe reprioritize these. And certainly some of the most morbid causes of hypercalcemia coming into the hospital is gonna be an underlying malignancy. But we have to hold that against the fact that this is a 42 year old woman, so maybe not necessarily the best demographic for that. So that's how I would be prioritizing it at, at, at this point. Um, uh, but again, it seems like, uh, I suspect that there's gonna be many more twists and turns as we go forward here. You know, um, Jack, you, you referred to you referred to the um, the journey through the lens of your brain, and I think a, a lot of us sit on VMR in deep admiration for what your brain is able to do. And, and maybe you can enlighten us for a second or two on like what what is it that drives you to 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 uh, pursue and essentially perfect this art? What is your fuel to want to learn so much? Oh man, you know, I think um, there are so many like different little nuances that end up feeding into this. Um, I will say that I don't know exactly where this came from, but I have always been curious about thinking and like the way that my brains work and the way that that minds work. Um, and I, I think, um, and I think like being able to have some awareness of the way that my own brain works, but also learn from the way that other people's minds work, that has always been something that is really, really fascinating to me. Um, and I think, um, uh, you know, there also is this sort of ways in which the cognitive ends up intersecting with the interpersonal and the relational that I think has always really, I think, yes, drawn me to medicine, but also really drawn me to the clinical reasoning space overall, both in terms of the way that it intersects with the interpersonal elements in terms of patient care. But I think as, as time has gone on, the thing that has also been really, um, uh, uh, really deeply meaningful and moving for me, um, uh, in addition to, or sort of right alongside patient care has been the learning process and um, uh, uh, and the opportunity to be a part of teaching as well. I think relationships with patients have always been incredibly important, but so too have relationships with colleagues and um, uh, sort of co-learners in the clinical environment. Um, and I think for me, this sort of process of, of exposing one's thinking, analyzing one's thinking and helping to refine one's thinking, yes, it has like this sort of deep-seated interest from sort of being interested in how to like think with more clarity and communicate and narrate one's thought processes with more clarity. But for me, this was sort of like the entry point into where I started to find some, 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 some sense of rhythm and comfort within clinical medicine. Like the first, um, like sort of through college and through the first couple of years of medical school, I think I really struggled to find a rhythm um, in the like very, um, uh, you know, heavily um, like bio, biochemical preclinical years and sort of, um, you know, always felt um, a little bit behind the ball in that space. And I was really lucky um, uh, that I had really great clinical teachers in the like my initial clerkships who were excellent clinicians and excellent teachers and sort of um, uh, exposed me to this field um, and built some, um, some sense of self-esteem for me that I felt like I was really lacking um, and felt, you know, I, again, I think ma many people here know, know the story, but like I, you know, had below, below national average step one scores um, and sort of struggled, struggled within the preclinical years and sort of felt behind the ball. And then again, sort of finding this love of sort of analyzing cases and thinking through cases and then, not, and then also teaching others how to do that was sort of the space in which I started to find some comfort, some professional identity and some rhythm in medicine. And I think those two things merged together in terms of my own um, interests, as well as, you know, things that helped to start to overcome some of these in insecurities that I carried in clinical learning. Um, and I think those two things just kind of caught fire and have been like a really wonderful self, um, uh, uh, self-fulfilling prophecy going forward. And then, you know, I came to UCSF for residency and then found, I think the third missing piece, which was community, you know, Charmaine, you, Robbie, Dan, um, the whole CP Solvers community that ended up growing from there, you know, all of the people in here that I got to meet. And I think that ended up being a real, um, uh, a piece that I didn't realize was missing until I found it. Um, and it again, has only sort of added, added fuel to that fire going forward. I'm going to sprinkle in a little bit more fuel by telling you how much more intriguing this um, case gets. Um, but you should look at the chat as to the love that you're getting about the wisdom you're sharing. I called back that number and nobody answered. Um, assuming they're too busy, I looked up the patient and saw that she was actually um, like literally a minute walk from where I happened to be in the ER. So I just walked over, walked over there to get a little bit of a history. And I walk in the room and she's in, uh, in bed one. And I remember the Moffitt ER, like the major, major resuscitation room, which got me really intriguing. And I immediately intrigued and really immediately figured out why. Her heart rate was like 140. It looked sinus on the monitor, confirmed later to be sinus. And her pressures were soft in the 90s. 
she looked her state at age, but looked very tired and fatigued um, and looked vulnerable. Um, she told me that she had moved to the US about five years ago and um, had been doing pretty well until three months ago, she um, bumped into a wall, walking out of a room, bumped into a wall, gently so, and um, didn't feel anything, but later had a lot of pain in that site. And ultimately, um, a few weeks after that initial bump, three months from, from this visit, three months prior to this visit, she was diagnosed with a rib fracture. And um, she was given topical therapy and medications, um, including NSAIDs. But over the last um, few months, she's basically lost weight, is peeing a lot, um, has lost her energy, and is just very, very uh, lethargic. She also feels like her vision is super blurry. She can't really see very clearly out of both eyes. And she notices that she's bruising so much more easily and bleeding so much more easily. The most prominent part is she has a lot of epistaxis almost daily, and you can actually see that there's old crusted blood in her, um, in her mouth. She had had no access to medical care, um, and, um, and so as a result has no known medical history, no pertinent health related behaviors. And um, I'll tell you, um, um, I'll tell you her exam and stop there. Chronically ill appearing and no acute distress. She does have conjunctival pallor. She has no lymphadenopathy. Uh, everything that I don't say just assume is normal for the sake of time. Her lungs are clear. Her heart's fast and regular, um, but no murmurs. She has a lot of tenderness to palpation at that site where she has the known rib fracture. Her belly's soft. She has had no edema, but she has pretty significant reduced skin turgor. And overall, your impression is she's pretty hypovolemic. Um, and I, um, I'll stop there. All right. Um, well, I think before diving into to the contents of the case, I would say like this, um, this case already feels incredibly meaningful to me because I feel like there is, um, uh, uh, an unspoken shared experience that I'm feeling with you as you present this, Robbie, um, which is the viscerally knowing so deeply the feeling of, um, uh, simultaneously being um, the intense desire to help this person solve this problem. And sometimes that like really overwhelming feeling of loneliness that can exist as an intern or as a resident um, while caring for a patient who is this acutely ill, but also grappling with the realities of sort of having to come to face um, uh, uh, how chronically ill they are um, and how alone they have been throughout that process of their chronic illness as well. And so I'm thinking of both the cognitive demands that I uh, can only imagine were um, uh, at the top of mind in this moment, but also the emotional demands that come that come right along with it. Um, I won't pretend to be able to summarize that tension well enough for, uh, 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 let alone in, uh, over these next two minutes, let alone the next 35, but I will say that that there is a, um, a Twitter thread from someone who I see on this VMR right now, um, Carol Lau, who I think summarized this tension and this weight beautifully. Um, uh, uh, and brilliantly recently. Um, and that is, I think, something that captured an experience that, um, again, uh, I didn't know could be captured so potently recently. Um, but again, that sort of feeling is coming up for me again. So hopefully, um, I will try to dig it up and put it in the chat. But if someone else has it, has it handy, I think it's worth a read for everybody um, uh, uh, to take a look through. Now, moving on to sort of like the contents of the case, I think um, there's two things that are jumping out to me. One of them is sort of the severity of the vital signs here with the sort of tachycardia and the hypotension. And I think what this does is doesn't help us make progress on um, uh, understanding the etiology of this patient's underlying illness, but it does help us understand the severity and the rapidity with which we need to take action and with which with which we need to move, right? There is one hypothesis that a young individual with um, uh, no known pre-existing medical problems that they may have a blood pressure that actually exists in the 90s over 50s as their normal baseline. Charmaine captured this point actually um, phenomenally well in her recent JGIM um, ECR, which I also think people should check out um, for, her, for, uh, for her case discussion on it. Um, but I think in the setting of, of such severe sinus tachycardia, we have to assume that there is sort of um, uh, hypotension driving this individual's process. Whether the hypotension is from uh, distributive physiology, hypovolemic physiology, whether that is from underlying bleeding, which we know that this individual is at risk for, or um, uh, just global volume loss, potentially from the hypercalcemia that she has been, that 
she has been experiencing, but also, right, potentially obstructive physiology, whether that is from underlying um, cardiac tamponade or pulmonary embolism, which seems unlikely um, in this individual who is not hypoxic at the same time, but certainly on the table. So again, we can see how difficult it is to make progress with just looking at the vital signs. But I think what, what is the two most helpful findings now is layering on the known hypercalcemia with these other findings that you gave us, Robbie. One of them being what I'm sort of translating as a pathologic fracture, as well as the finding of epistaxis um, and abnormal bruising and bleeding. If we just think about things that can lead to someone to develop a pathologic fracture, there is a whole list of them, some of which are, are quite common and you know relatively benign to things that are incredibly morbid and very, very sinister. Some of those benign things or some, some of those less morbid things that we may think about would be underlying metabolic bone disease, right? It would be rare, but not impossible for a 42 year old woman to develop, um, to, to develop osteoporosis. Um, uh, uh, but again, I think we have to assume that the more morbid things are going to be there, right? Is potentially this acute kidney injury actually more chronic kidney disease, which would further modify the risk for underlying metabolic bone disease. But if someone bumps into a wall and develops a rib fracture from that, my brain assumes that that is a pathologic fracture from an underlying sinister process until proven otherwise. So what could those, what could those sinister processes be? And the way that I think about it is that something has either is starting to replace the bone marrow in that place and replace it with something that is not normal healthy bone, or something has started to destroy the bone marrow in that area. Um, uh, for example, an underlying lytic lesion. Things that can replace the bone are gonna be sort of infiltrative bone marrow processes, whether that is something like an underlying leukemic process or for example, granulomas that may replace the bone marrow and lead to destruction in that space. Things that can then actually de um, uh, destroy the bone marrow there and cause lytic lesions. We are most often gonna think about met metastatic solid organ cancers, but then also, again, there are ways in which things can replace the bone marrow and lead to underlying lytic lesions at the same time. For example, multiple myeloma. If we look at the other findings that we have here and say, well, gosh, how can we make progress in deciding is something replacing the bone marrow diffusely or is something focally destroying the bone marrow, for example, like a solid organ metastasis, the finding of epistaxis, abnormal bruising and bleeding, I find quite helpful here because it tells us that, the, uh, that other things that the bone is responsible for are also being taken out here, right? For example, the conjunctival pallor suggests underlying anemia. The abnormal bruising and bleeding tells us that maybe there is, maybe there is also coexisting thrombocytopenia and potentially also abnormalities in the coagulation cascade as well that could be modifying this individual's risk, not only for pathologic fractures, but also for, um, for coagulation abnormalities. And if we then start to put those two Venn, Venn, Venn diagrams together, um, things that could cause to, to, um, uh, the bones to become weak, but also the things that the bone makes um, uh, to become abnormal, either in quantity or quality, um, then I think that starts to move the center of gravity of the case for me, at least right now, um, uh, uh, potentially prematurely towards thinking about, about bone marrow focused processes as the center of gravity of this case. Um, and so I think I'm going to be very attuned to what the CBC shows, but also attuned to what the underlying coagulation abnormalities show. Um, because for example, something like APML is a disease process that can attack the bone marrow, cause replacement of bone marrow, but also lead to devastating um, uh, bleeding abnormalities up front via um, uh, sort of spontaneous DIC. Um, and so I think that sort of is like the progress that I feel like I'm able to make right now. Again, that hypercalcemia combined with the abnormal bruising and bleeding being something that sort of puts the center of gravity at the bone marrow. Poetry. Um, this case is just about to get so idiosyncratic and so tough that I'm going to ask you to tell us something about you that is idiosyncratic that we don't know. What's one thing that you consider idiosyncratic that this crowd does not know about you? Huh. There's two things that that come Oh, you're to so mind. generous. Two? Okay. Um, <laughs> one of them is um, well, actually, I will say I think uh, I've talked before on on here before about yeah. um, uh, having a stutter and things like that. But I don't know if that many people know that, but you may hear as this case unfolds that the pauses between some of my words become prolonged. I wish that I could say that that is me just being overly pensive, but as I get nervous, which I'm already starting to, um, uh, as the case goes on, I will oftentimes insert filler words like many ums and, and ums, but also have uh, sometimes a longer pause between words. It's because I can feel 
um, a stutter coming on with the next word I'm, I'm going to say. So that is one thing. Uh, and then the other thing is, is, uh, is I love, um, I love reading words backwards. And I don't know yeah. where that comes from. I think it might what? have something to do with being left-handed, but like I yeah. used to like, when I would have trouble falling asleep at night as a kid, I would sit and like in bed, think of words and then think about how to say them backwards, which wow. is a very useless, um, uh, but, and also I think very, very idiosyncratic thing. So yeah, reading, reading words backwards is something that, uh, uh, I don't know where it came from, but it's something That's that so cool. continues to this day. I haven't seen, I haven't seen Anne, uh, Anne Rosa since her cameo appearance, um, in high school. I'm not sure where you're at, but, uh, in your, um, training now, uh, Anne Rosa Bilal. Uh, but it clearly had a lot in common with Dr. Jack Fetter here. Thank you. Um, let me, uh, amazing, welcome back. Uh, let me tell you, um, let me give you some data, then I have a question for the crowd. White count normal, hemoglobin 4.5, platelets normal. INR, normal, PTT, normal, diff, normal. Okay, team, y'all have been basking in the glory that is Dr. Jack Penner. We're getting to learn about his brilliant mind and his brilliant persona. I need you all to answer this question in the chat, everybody. Why? You're going to learn from it most if you answer it. Don't be scared. It's a gross opportunity for all of us. How many units of blood would you give this patient? Trust me, let's take a moment. You'll never ever be able to grow in this space because it's a very unique space unless you encounter such a rare case. So I won't give you any more data. I want you to tell me how much blood you would give this patient. Okay, a lot of votes for three or four. Aaron wants two. Oh, Debbie wants more data. Oh, sorry, can't give it to you. Not yet. The CBC comes back um, much quicker than the uh, other results, which is why you have this decision to make, two to four. Okay, all right. Let me give you another piece of data. Her liver enzymes are all normal. Her total protein is 13 and her albumin is 2.5. All right, team. How much hemoglobin do you want to give her now? Maybe not. Zero. Talk to him. Okay, amazing. All right, Dr. Fenner, I've set up the tension for you. Take it away. What do you think? I love it. I love this so much. Um, so I will, uh, I will tell everybody, the, um, before we got back the albumin and the total protein, the place that my brain went to was um, uh, a framework that actually I've learned from Ravi a number of times, which is bleeding diathesis with normal coags. Um, and there's a few things that can do this. Um, there are some primary bleeding disorders that cause a, um, uh, a sort of, uh, or that portend an increased risk for bleeding that will not necessarily affect the coagulation cascade. For example, von Willebrand's disease being one that can do it. We might think about it as having an isolated elevated PTT, but they can also all be all normal in these cases. Um, other things that can do it can be acquired nutritional deficiencies, for example, scurvy, and then potentially the very, very interesting world to dive into um, uh, is problems with actually the vessel wall itself, right? So the platelets are okay, the coagulation factors are okay, but the vessel wall itself has some abnormalities associated with it. For example, this is one of the ways by which individuals who have a disease like amyloid develop their bleeding disorders. But then we get this kicker, which is that we have um, uh, what everybody picked up on or what, what, what many people picked up on, this, ab this enormously high protein gap. And so that also makes us sort of question like, hey, wait a second, or do we think that the hemoglobin is low because of the way that the lab is calculating the hemoglobin or is this individual actually this anemic? 
The other place that we see this, where there is a large amount of protein in the bloodstream impacting, um, impacting serum studies is in the case of pseudohyponatremia, right? And so one of the things that I'm wondering here is, is the hemoglobin um, calculated to be low as a consequence of the very, very high protein level? Or are we going to say that the hemoglobin is indeed actually 4.5? Um, this becomes a bit more of a esoteric exercise to think through because where the new center of gravity is now is what the heck is causing a protein gap to, to be this, um, this large, right? Um, the total protein of 13 is about double what we, what, what we might normally see with an albumin that's close to half as normal. And there's a number of ways to think about an approach to a very large protein gap like this. One that I oftentimes find myself going to is asking myself the question of, are we dealing with a polyclonal process that's leading to a high amount of protein in the, blood, in the bloodstream? Or are we dealing with a monoclonal process that leads to a high amount of protein in the bloodstream? Things that can cause a polyclonal um, uh, uh, protein gap, which is, means that there's probably lots of antibodies circulating in the body, which are which the um, lab test reads as protein, um, but they're not necessarily clonal in nature, right? It's just more of a reactive process in the body. It's going to be underlying infections. For example, HIV and hepatitis C are two that can cause a protein gap, um, as well as underlying autoimmune or autoinflammatory disease, for example, things like lupus or other connective tissue diseases. I, was, I have seen very few protein gaps um, from polyclonal processes and never have they been this large with a protein gap of around 11. And so I think the severity and the amount of non-albumin protein that's in this individual's bloodstream to me suggests that this is a monoclonal process um, uh, or a paraproteinemia, which makes me worry about the potential finding of, for example, something like a monoclonal gammopathy, um, uh, the spectrum of which includes MGUS, smoldering multiple myeloma, or or multiple myeloma in this case, which would fit with many of the things that we see. For example, the hypercalcemia, the acute kidney injury, and the underlying pathologic fracture. But um, uh, this fit is tempered by the fact that uh, uh, one, um, uh, it's hard to necessarily make real progress on that hypothesis without, without taking a look at what's going on in the bone marrow, but also by virtue of the fact that there's so many things that are um, not fitting well in this case. For example, the major the major discordance between the low hemoglobin and the absence of other bleeding abnormalities that I do question whether or not, um, that I do question which of these lab normal, um, lab values are telling us the true story and which of these are a consequence of some underlying abnormality there within. But I think overall, I think where this is leading me now is to, is to one, query whether or not this is a true anemia and then to want to explore further the cause of this protein gap, which things like an SPEP serum-free light chains could be very, very helpful with. And then again, wondering in my head, if the hemoglobin is indeed 4.5, how are we getting this bleeding diathesis? Is it from something like an underlying bleeding disorder like von Willebrand's disease or a vessel wall abnormality problem? For example, something like amyloid. Oh, I know, Jack, we could listen to you teach forever. I'm curious, do you think, is there a topic that you love teaching the most, most or like a specific domain within medicine that really, really um, tickles your fancy? You know, pneumonia never gets old. I was actually recently, ah. I was recently just um, in the ER um, a couple weeks ago, um, talking with one of the, one, one of the amazing UCSF residents. Um, I won't, I won't re reveal their name on here just to spare them from, um, uh, uh, for me raving about them. But I will say like, like we shared uh, just a run of the mill community acquired pneumonia case together. And I was like, it never gets old and it never gets boring. Like all of the variations within, right? How, how we decide what the chest x-ray is telling us, whether or not there's a coexisting paranemonic effusion. Empyemas will forever be, um, uh, was like one of the first schemas um, uh, uh, I ever, I ever built, right. built myself. And so uh, that, that will always have a soft spot. And then um, uh, I think vasculitides as well is um, another one that will ever be close to my heart because it's the first schema I ever got to make for the CP solvers with awesome. GPA. That's right. I remember the GPA one. And I think if Kirtan is alive anywhere in the universe right now and heard that, I think he would come and give you a big hug, the overlap of your love for vasculitis. Yeah, we do share that. We do share yeah, that. Definitely. You know, I think what, um, I think uh, your analysis of this case is it was uh, um, uh, really was a game changer in the moment. I think that um, there were so many things to, um, to um, analyze this case with, but one key question was, well, what data is right and what data is influenced by just how the high, high the protein is. Protein is. And so we got point of care um, hemoglobin, which was the same. So it's a different test. 
of the same thing through the blood, blood gas analyzer and the result was actually five. And the electrolytes were very similar off the serum than they were off the um, lab. So let me give you what the electrolytes were. Her sodium uh, was 128. All her electrolytes were otherwise normal with the exception of a calcium, which was 14. Her creatinine um, was double what it had been before, about 1.5. Those are the pertinent abnormalities. So sodium 128, creatinine 1.5, and calcium of 14. And in the moment, the focus was she has a heart rate of 140, and her um, her blood pressure is softish. I, you take a closer look at her blood pressure and realize that she has a pretty wide pulse pressure. So her pulse her pulse was say like. At some point, it was probably like 110 over 40 or 50 to give you a specific number. Um, and we're like, hold on, we have, we have this really, really um, impressive sinus tachycardia and this wide pulse pressure, what's going on with the heart? So we got an EKG, which showed sinus tach, no ischemic changes. We got a troponin that was negative and um, we got a BNP. And the BNP was super high. It was about 1,500. So we then started to analyze this case purely from like what, is, what needs to happen before this patient goes up out of the ER. And so prompted by that said, okay, listen, we're worried about cancer, as you said. Let's make sure she doesn't have a PE or a pericardial effusion. And so we got a CTPE that showed no PE or no pericardial effusion. And um, I'll leave it at that, really with the hopes that we focus on the acute thoracic dimensions of this case. And I'll give you some more data um, that'll come back um, about the other thread. But now let's hang out and explore the heart rate stuff. All right, that sounds great. Well, I will say, you know, the chat as always is already sharing some, some phenomenal pearls about how we can potentially reconcile um, what I think, at least for me initially, is um, a, a bit of some possible counterproductive patho pathophysiology. Whenever I see tachycardia plus hypotension, um, uh, uh, my sort of brain first reflexes to the possibility of whether or not we're dealing with some sort of hypovolemic and or distributive physiology. Most of those cases, though, should come with the finding of an L or of a low rather than a high BNP. If we think about what ends up leading to the release of BNP or B-type natriuretic peptide, um, uh, what is pro probably at least from my from my memory the most potent driver of it is going to be the finding of atrial stretch, right? And an individual who is hypo who is hypovolemic or has di distributive pathophysiology should not be having a lot of atrial stretch because they either don't have a lot of fluid in their blood vessels to stretch the atrium at all, or the fluid that is there is pooling in the periphery and in the subcutaneous spaces as a result of leaky blood vessels. And so the finding then of the combination of a very, very high PNP level plus tachycardia and hypotension then makes brings in the possibility of, are we actually dealing with a possible high output heart failure state, right? That is a very, very rare possibility. And so the other thing that we have to think about is, okay, um, what are some other things that could be driving some of the vital sign abnormalities that we see, particularly this very, very wide pulse pressure? And if we double click on the finding of the wide pulse pressure and ask ourselves, what could do that? There's a few things that could do it, right? If we just think mechanistically, what does it mean? It means that when blood is not flowing, flowing through the blood vessels, the blood vessels are very, very relaxed. When blood does come through, there is a very prominent um, force that the blood that gets pumped out of the left ventricle exerts on the vessels. And that could be due to two reasons. One of them, or actually three reasons. One of them is that the amount of blood leaving the vest or leaving the left ventricle is an enormous amount, right? That we are dumping blood into the vessels and that's gonna send the pressure that hits the, the vessel wall up very, very high, right? So the blood vessel is very, very relaxed in its diastolic state. And so the blood pressure within there will be low. And then an enormous amount of blood comes in and it's going to give us a high pressure, right? This is one of the mechanisms by which aortic insufficiency can cause a very, very wide pulse pressure, which is one of the things to think about when a pulse pressure is this high. The other thing is that in aortic insufficiency, all of the blood flows back. So the amount of blood that's actually moving in diastole is low, which further widens that pulse pressure. So that's hypothesis one. 
there is a huge stroke volume because of a valvular abnormality. Hypothesis two is that there is a huge, huge stroke volume because of the fact that this individual is under an enormous amount of physiologic stress and they have very, very accommodating blood vessels, which I think is certainly possible in a young, um, uh, a seemingly otherwise healthy woman, right? And so there could just be very, very high adrenergic tone that's leading to a high stroke volume to compensate for either the hypovolemia or the distributed physiology. In elderly individuals, the blood vessel can get stiff, so they don't accommodate blood, blood flow very well. But then the other possibility is actually that there's multiple, multiple mechanisms of these are coming into play. The heart is working very, very hard, and um, the heart is also starting to back up a little bit. And this is the mechanism of, of underlying high output heart failure, um, uh, which I won't talk about in detail right now, just for the sake of time. But I think those are some of the hypotheses coming into play. Right. I just gave you all a list. And what I will always try to push myself to do is to not is to, um, in addition to listing things, prioritize them and ask ourselves which of those seems most likely here. Certainly, an underlying distributed physiology seems likely. But as we said before, that doesn't necessarily give us a very high BNP like this. Right. Aortic insufficiency seems possible, but potentially unlikely given that we don't necessarily hear that rhythm. Although I will say, um, or sorry, that we don't hear that murmur, but I will say I have um, seldom heard AI when it is indeed there, just by how difficult of a murmur it can be to actually auscultate, right? Of those things that we did list though, the ones that can give us a very high BNP and a very wide pulse pressure could be something like high output heart failure, um, which may be a consequence of, again, the underlying distributive physiology that we're dealing with, plus some underlying cardiac abnormality here. Um, and so uh, the way that that ends up being diagnosis, usually we need some sort of cardiac catheterization, but that also becomes important because if we think about where our mind might reflex to do here is to aggressively volume resuscitate this person, but this would maybe temper me and make me concerned and say, gosh, if I give this person volume, things might get worse, right? Their heart might not be able to accommodate if we're dealing with the high output heart failure state. And so where this does then start to send me is to say, gosh, I'm going to be maybe more gentle with volume resuscitation than I might reflexively start to be be very, very closely monitoring signs of worsening vascular congestion. Um, and then also being, uh, I would say, cautious about um, uh, how we think about vasopressors in this situation if we do end up going towards that route, because a weak heart that sees high afterload from pressors um, could start to fail even more. Um, and so to be honest, I think that I, uh, uh, as things play out, I see ourselves running into a wall very, very quickly hemodynamically by virtue of the heart not necessarily being able to accommodate volume, but also struggling to support her blood pressure as well. Amazing, absolutely amazing. I'm about to give you a couple of tests that will give you clarity on the things that you're chasing down. And as this case comes to an end, I think it's a stark contrast to your, um, you're on the sun beginning. And I'm curious, what do you, uh, what are you hoping this year will be like? What do you think we'll be talking about when we're celebrating your next birthday on here? Oh, I will, um, uh, I will get um, as open as, or as vulnerable as I possibly can be here. Um, I uh, hope that this year um, is one of focusing much more on like paths and much less on destinations. Um, I think um, I, this is something that I think is a, a very challenging element of medicine in general, but also something that I have brought to many, many different dimensions of my life. Um, this idea of like always wanting to lean forward into what's next um, and have sort of very spent a lot of time doing that and missing what is actually here right now. Um, this is something that has happened for me um, in career related things, um, interpersonal related things, um, uh, romantic relationships with my now wife, Christine. Um, and uh, I think what I am really trying to do is um, let go of the impulse to think about where I want to be and instead um, spend much more time figuring out how to enjoy where I am right now. And I think, again, this applies like literally in terms of like career advancements, but also I think personally, just in terms of like who I am and where I'm at right now. And so, um, uh, uh, for example, in thinking through this case, right, um, it is very compelling for my brain to say like, oh gosh, I'm sure, I sure hope that I'm right. Um, as opposed to being like, I sure hope that the journey I took is one that I can learn from, one that was hopefully um, uh, valuable for other people, like valuable for other people to, to listen to these ramblings and where the outcome is, is where the outcome is. Um, so I, I guess that's a long way of saying, I hope that next year I can say that I've made some, um, uh, that I've gotten more comfortable with the, um, with the path and let go of the destination, 
both as it comes to thinking about professional things, um, but also um, just enjoying what's here right now, as opposed to leaning forward into what's next or what's to come. Uh, it sounds like the next year is about 365 individual unique days, which um, is absolutely marvelous. Um, I hope most of them will be here in VMR selfishly, um, but for your sake, maybe a manageable fraction. Um, there, you, your journey that you took with this case is both um, educational and accurate. Her serum viscosity comes back four times the upper limit of normal. I'm sparing you the units because I know they're different in different places. Her SPEP is positive for an IgD spike, which is eight grams per liter. Normal is less than 1.5. Her capita lambda ratio is over 100. And I'll stop there. All right. Well, you know, I think with these findings here now, um, uh, I think we make an uh, enormous amount of progress in being able to make um, what I think is, uh, I, I, I think, but uh, honestly, I don't have the criteria memorized, but I think that this gives us enough to make a diagnosis of multiple myeloma because we have um, uh, a monoclonal gammopathy with the IgG spike and the very, very high kappa to lambda ratio. Um, we have findings of severe anemia, as well as other signs of end organ damage with the AKI, the hypercalcemia, and the renal dysfunction. What I have a hard time reconciling here, um, uh, it, and, and I will be honest, is where the high output heart failure comes from. Um, I'm really curious to learn this from you, Ravi. Um, I think the, the place that my brain goes reflexively is, you know, is this basically like asking the heart to, to pump mud? Um, and that is puts an enormous amount of demand on on um, uh, on the heart, or um, as Yasmin is mentioning, is it from the anemia or from some combination of both? Um, I will say I have thought through hyperviscosity very, very few times in my life, um, but it did come up this morning at, um, at uh, morning report as well. Um, and so this is a, a really exciting motivation. But I think while, um, while I feel like we're now at the point of, of finding something like multiple myeloma in here, there still are a lot of loose ends that I don't necessarily quite have a great sense of one of which is these bleeding abnormalities and the setting of normal platelets like how exactly is that being mediated whether it's through amyloid deposition in this individual's blood vessels or from some other mechanism and then also what is the mechanism of the high output heart failure um, but i think what i'm most struck by is i look back and um, see that this person um, uh, is 42 years old and i think um, honestly like on this in the setting of the vulnerability or in the setting of the reflection that i just shared i think something like this um, really does hit home, um, which is uh, what the cost of that, I think this brings home for me um, what the cost of that leaning forward can potentially be. Because um, I imagine that, you know, in many ways, this 42 year old woman was uh, not that much different than, you know, than many of us here um, at whatever age we are now, right? And I think the idea that 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 she came into the hospital and things really changed um, at the drop of a hat brings home that point of, um, of you know, appreciating what is here. Um, and I think that uh, to be able to be here and to learn and think through this with you all and feel just such an immense amount of love from the crew here, I think really um, drives home the reason for, um, uh, at least for me, for that aspiration that I shared, because it's something that I really don't want to miss because I think um, uh, I'm really struck uh, and devastated by seeing, just seeing how severe of an illness uh, somebody so young has, um, uh, and uh, feeling very, very sad and worried for what the what the ultimate underlying tra tra trajectory of this is. And I really appreciate that reflection. I think that at the end of the day, she was diagnosed with a very morbid condition. She had multiple myeloma, with a very rare complication of multiple myeloma, which is that she had hyperviscosity syndrome. And so she got emergent um, leukophoresis and plasmapheresis with improvement in her tachycardia hypotension near resolution in the, in the first couple of days, confirming that she had hyperviscosity. And then, you know, I followed up on her um, uh, three years after, and she had actually gotten um, uh, therapy for multiple myeloma, chemotherapy, multiple myeloma, and was in a, in a sustained remission for a long period of time. Um, I haven't checked in on her case because I no longer have access to her records for the last three or four years, but last I checked, she was doing just fine and was in remission. And I think the um, in very uh, complicated dimensions of this case are all the, or the nerdy stuff that you talked about, but um, 
I think not giving somebody a transfusion when they're anemic is, was a very powerful lesson for us to learn in the moment. And there's a lot to learn about in this case from hyperviscosity to high output cardiac failure, but I'll just um, leave that as an exercise for folks to push their reasoning, but answer the question that you had about like, wh how, why does she have high output cardiac failure? And I'm having you, if you start at the basics by defining heart failure as an elevated filling pressure in one of your favorite chambers, whichever one, usually the right atrium. So why is the pressure elevated in the right atrium? Well, either there's something wrong with the wall, the high pericardial pressure, something wrong with the myocardium, so a stiff or um, hypocontractile muscle, or there's something wrong in the actual fluid itself as, as to the source of the increased pressure. The vast majority of patients with high output cardiac failure, uh, well, the vast majority of patients with heart failure have an issue not with the fluid itself. That's why they have heart failure and meaning, that's why they have heart failure defined as an elevation in their pressure. And uh, it's not high, out, high output because if it's a problem with the pericardium or the myocardium, the heart can't contract as well. So to summarize, when you're diagnosing heart failure, you're saying that the patient has elevated filling pressure. And the source of that pressure in the middle of the right atrium is either because of the fluid itself, the heart muscle, or the pericardium. The vast majority of people have an issue with the heart muscle or the pericardium, and those people cannot eject blood as well, so they have low output cardiac failure. How can you have cardiac failure with a high output? It's when the problem is in the fluid itself. And there are many ways that the fluid itself can be problematic, usually because too much of it is coming to the heart too quickly. That's the crux of high output cardiac failure. The best example of this is an AVM. So if you have an AVM, instead of that blood sitting in your feet, hanging out in your capillaries, bathing your cells, it comes right back to the heart. It's high output cardiac failure. In this instance, the problem with the fluid is not the amount of volume it exerts in the heart, but the sheer weight of it, as you said. It's mud. It is like replacing her plasma with cement, essentially, and watching the heart struggle uh, under high pressures, but the muscles be just as strong. Of course, all high output cardiac failure eventually turns into low output heart failure because the heart can only pump so hard, so vigorously for such a short period of time. Um, so a very, very humbling case, um, one that taught me um, so much. We're only focusing on the medical dimensions. Um, there was a lot of time to connect with this young woman who was an immigrant to this country who suffered a devastating disease, but also to celebrate the joys of her finally having access to, um, in some ways, uh, the best healthcare system in the world, in some ways, in um, many ways, very limited. <laughs> Um, but she got, came to an emergency room, she got plasmapheresis, chemotherapy, and got in contact with uh, many, many, many people, nurses, doctors, physical therapists, occupational therapists, social support, who um, helped her um, turn her life around. Um, so it was really cool to see the, the tremendous positives that came out of this too. Um, Thoughts, reflections, um, Jack, before we hand the mic to Deborah to uh, take us home. Deborah and Shema, I, I didn't see Shema's name, it was too awesome. Um, I, I mean, I think just uh, uh, as as it often is at the end of at, at the end of any VMR case, it's just gratitude. I think uh, uh, I feel immensely lucky uh, to get to practice thinking out loud like this, um, uh, and to get to sort of exist in this space of of uh, feeling the joy of getting to think through a case combined with the inspiration of getting to um, uh, getting to sort of uncover the edges of knowledge and, and feel inspired and motivated to start to um, expand those and fill in the untapped corner so far. Um, uh, but that sort of intellectual or sort of content mediated gratitude um, uh, pales in comparison uh, to just the gratitude of this community here. You know, I think uh, uh, it feels uh, uh, un uncomfortable in all the right ways um, uh, to feel the support from this crew here um, uh, uh, and yeah I am um, uh, I'm it is immensely meaningful and really moving for me and so I just want to say thank you all um, Robbie thank you for taking the time to prepare and present a case on what I know is day 28 straight of work for you um, uh, for you to be here um, uh, uh, and again put in the time and effort to 
um, pull out the case out of me, but also some of these other reflections. Um, uh, it means the world to me. And uh, I just, I, I can't thank this community enough, um, this group, and also just all of the friends that I've had a chance to make through the CP solvers. Um, this place has been a lifeline for me. This community has been a lifeline for me um, over the last few years uh, uh, in many, many ways, um, many of which I think uh, uh, I won't fully appreciate for a long time. So I just want to say thanks, everyone. Uh, I, had a, I had an absolute blast. I'm going to cry soon, so I'm going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, I know Deborah and Shima have a message for you, so I'll pass the mic to them. Hi, Jack. So um, today, I don't want to read the teaching points. I want to say like how special you are. Like for me, when I got here to the CPS Solvers, you were one of, one of the first persons that I interact with. In, in student VMR, we always hang out. So I'm always thankful and happy to share moments with you, to learn with you, how good mentor you are and so committed it to us the last time you were connected from your car. And then I said, oh my God, I can't believe. So thank you so much. Thank you for spending your time and always teaching us. You are, uh, you really inspire me. And I, I, I want to continue learning with you for, um, for much years. So yeah, that's my teaching point for today. <laughs> thank you so much, Deborah. I will do it as long, uh, as long as you and everyone else here lets me. So thank you. Um, until your 100th birthday, Dr. Fenner. That is the goal. We look forward to it. Happy Halloween, everybody. And on, um, on behalf of Jack, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, for coming here and um, your presence is uh, basically coming here to get candy from the six to seven year old Dr. Jack Fenner. We're all uh, grateful, uh, really, really grateful. And um, Jack, I, we don't have any words. We are um, struck by the sheer intellectual might of your brain, um, but it is frankly overshadowed by um, the high output without failure um, from your heart. Thank you for sharing that with us here today. And uh, I'm excited to see you at five o'clock. I'll um, see you soon, my man. I'll see you soon. I'm, I'm sitting in Jack's office, by the way, which is the ultimate irony of this case. <laughs> Alrighty, thanks y'all. Bye.